just since we've added a few individuals to the budget committee, just go around and introduce our staff. And so I'll start with John and then we'll work this way. Uh, John Mead. And how long you've been on the committee? And uh, I've been on the committee for, uh, I believe, five years. Okay. I'm Zach Geary, city council for what? A couple hours, a couple days now? A couple, <laughs> couple of weeks. Couple of weeks yes. We saw you saw yourself short. <laughs> I try. Uh, Remy Drabkin, city council. Wendy Stassen, city council. Jerry Hart, budget committee. And Jerry, you've been on quite a while. I have been on quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave, we'll, I have no, no idea how long. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it at that because it, it dates us a little bit. Uh, Scott Hill Mayor. Cherry. Cherry Haas. Who just came on uh, at our last council meeting. Leanna. Leanna Gottney. Same. Same? Just okay. recently. Kelly Menke, City Council. Sal Peralta, City Drew Milligan, Budget Committee. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are meeting tonight, as I said, in preparation for the bu budget preparation. And we heard the Budget Committee last year talk a little more about having a more thoughtful approach to preparing for the budget. And so we've heard you. And so we thought that it would be uh, it would be great tonight to sit down and talk a little bit about the process. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the strategies of budgeting, uh, the process. And so we've got Marsha and Jeff that are going to lead us in our discussion tonight. This is very open format. Raise your hand. We'll recognize any questions and move forward with that. And so with that being said, uh, Jeff and Marsha, I'll turn it over to you and we'll go from there. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council, members of the Budget Committee. I'm Jeff Tower. I'm your City Manager and Budget Officer. Marcia Bargari, our Finance Director, is here to set me straight tonight. Uh, in response to some of the uh, sort of closing critiques we heard from the Budget Committee last year, we decided to have this mid-year meeting. Uh, we'll spend some time overviewing uh, MacTown 2032, which is our strategic plan. Uh, some of you have seen chunks of this before. Some of it may be a little bit new to you. But the strategic plan was an effort that we started last year and we talked about it in its sort of infant stages in the budget process. Uh, the plan has been completed and was adopted by the council at their last council meeting at, in early January. And we expect this document to really be uh, um, a driving force behind not just the work that we do, but the budgets that we prepare in the coming future. So uh, we're going to spend some time really talking a little bit about process and the higher level findings, not necessarily uh, the details of the plan. And it's uh, certainly an opportunity for questions and comments, uh, and you'll see more of this as we move through the budget process later this year. Uh, Marsha will talk about our mid-year uh, budget report and our um, forecast and uh, we'll plan to wrap this up a few minutes before seven o'clock tonight and hopefully it, it does a good job of kind of setting a foundation for the budget committee's work later this spring uh, just a reminder uh, the components of the strategic plan include mission vision values a series of strategic priorities with goals and objectives and specific action plans and targets uh, the revised uh, new vision for the uh, city uh, is on the board. I'm not going to read it to you. And I'm going to move quick. It says here I have 71 slides. I'm mortified that I may have saved the wrong slideshow presentation. I'm not going to read 71 slides to you tonight. Um, although that might include the rest of the agenda. Right. That includes the rest of the council agenda too. Uh, city's mission. Um, uh, so just a reminder, a vision is where we want to go. A mission is, uh, is what we do and how we do it. Uh, we've also identified what we think are some core values for the organization. Uh, stewardship. Equity. Courage. And accountability. And again, that mission, vision, values are the highest level aspects of the plan. Uh, how we try to make that real is that we've identified seven strategic priorities. Uh, most of these were fairly well set when we met as a budget committee 
last spring, we had these drafts. Some of the language uh, has been refined and the, and the specific goals, I think, are, are probably a little bit different. Uh, but city capacity, civic leadership, safety and resiliency, economic prosperity, engagement and inclusion, growth and development character, and housing opportunities really emerged as early themes through the strategic planning process and, and continued through the course of the planning effort. Uh, we expect that these uh, seven strategic priorities were, will be where we make most of our investments. We think we're already doing a fair amount of that now, uh, but this will help us to, to, to really refine that. We created a number of objectives uh, under each of the goals uh, for the strategic initiatives. Civic leadership. <clears throat> Pardon me. Community safety and resiliency. Economic prosperity, uh, this is a reminder that the product for economic prosperity looks a little different than the rest of the strategic plan. We actually had a parallel process uh, with a different consultant team and a different steering committee worked on economic prosperity. And so some of the product looks a little bit different. Uh, the approach that we took with economic prosperity is we really have two different kinds of goals. We have some foundational goals and strategies that are really broadly beneficial across uh, multiple sectors, uh, the actions related to those foundational goals often fall to the city. And you'll see some of that as we, as we move through the process in the coming years. Target sector goals and strategies are really around specific clusters or sectors in related industries. And a lot of those responsibilities fall to our partners and where the city may be at the table or maybe a contributing member, but we wouldn't necessarily be the lead on some of those issues. The foundational goals and strategies that we identified were related to living wage, improved systems for economic mobility and inclusion, and maintaining and enhancing our quality of life. The target sector goals uh, were arrayed around traditional industry and advanced manufacturing, technology entrepreneurship, hospitality and place-based tourism, as well as craft and uh, beverages and food systems and uh, education, medicine, and other sciences. Engagement and inclusion. Growth and development character. And housing opportunities. There's a lot of I think synergy and overlap between some of these initiatives and oftentimes the action plans that we put together will likely address and ideally address more than one strategic initiative, but at least one. Um, one of the things that we'll do before we turn to questions is let you know that we've also put together a robust roster of actions, particularly in year one and year two. Uh, we've got dozens of projects and actions that were identified in the strategic plan. Uh, it's widely available, it's on our website right now. If we haven't already sent you the link to the lay members of the budget committee, we'll, we'll do that as a follow-up piece. And what we really tried to, to do was identify those near-term one and two-year projects that we would spend time working on, a number of which we, we've already incorporated into this year's budget. So some of them will look familiar to you because we talked about them during the budget process last year. But we also tried to identify a, a list of projects that we felt could be prioritized and would really be uh, not just extra high priority work, but uh, really help us refine the work that we do and really target uh, our projects in a strategic way. Any questions about sort of the high and median level plan or the process that we went through to get there? Jeff, just to let the budget committee members know that, again, this is a, a broad overview of the, the, pr the process that we've gone through. And Jeff indicated there's very specific actionable items under each of those headings, the seven headings. And as a, as a uh, council, Friday, we're gonna be spending all day in our, our annual planning where we'll have an opportunity to look at the strategic plan and pick a, 
a couple of a couple of uh, actions that we feel we can uh, put a priority on and that could be obtainable in the next one to two years. And thus it will zero our focus um, to doing certain things for the next one to two years. We know that the strategic plan could be good for us. Uh, it, it could be a guideline for the next 10, 15 years. We'll go back to that every one to two years, picking those things that we need to execute again. And so it's an ongoing process for the council. But once we set a direction for the one to two years, we're going to be headed in that direction. So just to let you know, that's, that's where we are as a council. We've seen this, but we've not worked with it, and that will happen Friday all day. We'll have our, our, our off-site. So questions at this point. Again, this just gives you hopefully some vision of what we've been doing over the last 18 months, and it does have uh, input into where we're going to be spending our money. Liam? I just had a question about uh, previous strategic planning uh, for the budget committee and how does that typically look? I mean, is, is this similar to what you've done in the past? This is our first one. Ah. So it's, you know, one of the interesting things about McMinnville in my observation is that the community has been really intentional and really thoughtful about how it's grown and how it's evolved and how it engages its citizens. And we see the benefit of that all around us. And, and yet we haven't actually gone through a strategic planning effort quite like this before. Uh, there have been annual goal setting sessions that have been going on for a couple of decades probably. Um, I know it's something that uh, Ed Wormley helped put in place uh, early when he was the mayor. One of the things, one of the reasons that um, we decided to pursue a strategic plan is that the organization and the community is going through what I call a generational shift in leadership. Uh, the council is a newly constituted body, five of whom are in their first terms or five minutes into their second term in their current position. We have nine uh, members of our 12 member executive team who are in their current positions for six years or less. And, and that kind of rapid turnover hasn't really happened in this organization uh, for a long time, if ever. It's tended to be a little bit more gradual and a little bit more um, consistent. And, and so having that significant shift and, and that kind of demographics playing out in other organizations, other businesses, uh, other parts of the community where we're seeing that sort of generational churn in leaders. Uh, and so we felt like a strategic plan would be the right mechanism to help the community move forward, uh, particularly given that change in leadership. Cherry. Uh, so you spoke to the fact that there's been a previous goal Yes. And over the years, has there been effort to go back and evaluate whether those goals attain, whether the actions of the Supreme Council will meet those goals, or what, what is the goal? I guess the real question, I guess, is how worthwhile is it to go through a goal making session? So I'm. I'm going to ask somebody who's been here for more than two years to answer that question. So what I will say is that the goals that were adopted two years ago, in one form or another, most, if not all of those goals, ended up being woven into the strategic plan. So they don't necessarily show up uh, in the same order, in the same words as they were two years ago. But there's, there's nothing from two years ago in terms of kind of high level substance that's not incorporated into this plan. And so while the plan itself is new, I think it's more of an evolution of how we've done things and the kinds of goals that the council has set over a long period of time. And I'll just give some historic background, Jerry and uh, budget committee members. Uh, we have always had a process of setting annual goals and we come together and it was a Friday night and all day Saturday and, and sometimes we met with department heads and other times we didn't. We liked it when we had department heads, but we were able to have a great dialogue. Again, we picked out in some areas that we felt were headings, topics, and set two to three goals. And then that became kind of the scorecard for our city manager. And, and the city manager would update the council every two months or on a quarterly basis where we were in completion of that. And when he 
or, her, or she expected us to be able to accomplish that goal. And so, yes, we've always had this, this visioning, goal setting, and accountability to that. And it's one of the things I think over, um, you know, the last 16 years that I've been involved at the council level has helped us be focused. But again, it didn't have a lot of transparency. You know, we, what we brought to the table in talking to our constituents is what the transparency was and where this process was primarily driven by the public uh, and those being on certain committees. And uh, I'll tell you from a council perspective, we've had to sit back a little bit and listen and this Friday is going to be our first time to really get a, get around, but it's we've been waiting for 18 months to get where we're at. So I, does that answer? Oh, it does, and, and for the new budget committee members, the, historically what's happened is that we have we get a budget, and it's either you know a PDF, big PDF, or it's a notebook, and we meet, and uh, it's all there's a great deal of pressure to get it all done in about two and a half hours in the budget committee process has basically been spending a lot of time over maybe uh, one tenth or one percent of the, the total budget. And so uh, some of the some of the budget committee members kind of uh, I characterized myself as whining a little bit last year at the budget committee hearing that what are we doing, you know, as a budget committee? We just come for you know this two, two and a half, three hour session and really don't have a huge amount of input into anything. And so that's, and I, and I really appreciate uh, the council for, I don't know if, it's, if I appreciate coming out on a you know, January <laughs> evening like this, but, but it's really, I think part, part of the reason we're here is because of the feedback and the city council heard us, members of the budget committee last budget hearing. And so I do appreciate that. Well, to tag on to that too, Jerry, um, you know, um, it's a process that we go through to get the proposed budget. And again, that's going to get to you probably two, maybe three weeks before our budget hearing. But what, uh, from the audit committee perspective, and Marsha's a part of that, and Kelly and I, is to go back and take a look at last year's budget because you know, it's not going to deviate too much from that. And you can look at that and you can have input um, and, and, and do that earlier than later. Because as you know, if we wait just till the night of the budget committee, uh, sometimes it's awfully hard to, to, it's a cause and effect. If we take from here where we take it from and those types of things, we're constrained by a beginning and ending um, uh, balances and our contingency is at a certain level that we need it to be. And so again, I think that would be one message that we would ask for you today is, you know, start preparing for this current budget cycle by going back to last budget and taking a look at it and having the time and then being able to reach out to members of the budget committee, the council or staff or Jeff or Marsha and getting answers to your questions. Kelly. I, I agree. I've been saying this for the last couple of council meetings. It's, when you get that budget, it's about three to four inches thick. You're not. It's very difficult to absorb that in less than two weeks, which is what you'll have. So if you look at last year's, it's going to give you a really good feel for what's happening and some of the issues. And then you can hopefully do some skimming or some serious reading with the knowledge of what you picked up from the year before. And you've got, you know, like, Four months to do it in. So that, that's probably one of the best things I can recommend. Other questions? Can I just say, Jerry, you got an excellent taste in shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you, do you uh, shop at a place called Costco like I do? <laughs> that's right. Okay, any other comments or questions? We're going to turn it over to Marsha now. I'm going to let you drive from here on out. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, and members of the budget committee, I'm really happy to see all the budget committee members here tonight. I want to uh, begin actually by issuing an open invitation to any budget committee member, any counselor, who would like to meet with us and uh, get a review of the budget process. Uh, the process is structured 
uh, to a great extent around the state of Oregon's local budget law. So the public hearings and the timing and uh, a lot of those requirements are dictated um, to us by the law. Uh, and But if you'd like to hear more about our internal process, I guess, and how we get together and uh, talk about what's going to be in the budget and um, how we make decisions about priorities, we would be happy to go over that too. Uh, last November, we uh, brought to the council a general fund first quarter update for 2018-19, the current fiscal year. Uh, I wanted to spend just a minute uh, reviewing that to bring everyone up to speed. In November, we reported that the general fund reserve carried forward from 1718 to 1819 was 6.8 million and approximately 30% of annual expenditures. We also reported at that time, at the end of the first quarter, that we anticipated general fund revenues and expenditures would be in line with what we expected. We periodically, um, well, actually continually are monitoring our budgets. Uh, the first quarter, mid-year are, are um, times especially when we look at our budgets. Because that way, if something unanticipated had happened, we could make uh, mid-year course adjustments. Okay, so tonight though, we're talking about the, the forecast and um, the mid-year forecast. Uh, council members and budget committee members, you may remember that we do a forecast as part of the uh, budget process and the budget committee, we talk about that. This is the mid-year updated forecast. Um, here again, we really don't see any um, significant variances in revenues or expenditures for 2018-19. Uh, but one of the things that we do with uh, mid-year is when the budget was adopted in June, we did not know for certain what our carry forward would be from 17, 18, 19. So when you hear us talk about the reserve, it really is that amount that's carried forward from one fiscal year to the next. We didn't know what that amount was going to be in June. So um, in this forecast, this updated forecast, uh, we do know now what the ending balance was at June 30 of 18. And so that's been incorporated into the forecast that we'll be looking at tonight. Um, may I ask a question about the uh, increase in state marijuana revenues? Um, uh, Perhaps somebody else can speak to this, or perhaps you can speak to this. Um, but everything I've been reading is that there's a, a, a glut in that market right now. And, and so um, there's a major downturn. And so is that uh, increase something that um, that you feel safe having in there as an assumptive increase in, in revenue? I think that's a very good question. Um, as we are going through this forecasting process, and especially looking forward to the forecast that we'll be doing as part of the budget process, we'll be going back and looking at those numbers. Uh, the state and marijuana revenues are actually a fairly small uh, part of the general fund revenue, I think about 100,000. Um, and the 4% would, would have been based on the very short history that we have uh, accumulated to date on how that revenue has been increasing. But that is a, a really good question. And we do um, look at all those numbers as we go through the year. Uh, the the mid-year forecast really is the first step in our budget process. Uh, you know, to determine whether the next year's budget's affordable, we have to look at the impact on future budgets. And the forecast helps us frame uh, the proposed budget within the, that longer term. So when we um, create the forecast, of course, we are relying on assumptions about uh, revenues and expenditures. And as you might expect, those assumptions are based on prior year trends and uh, as well as future expectations. And that might be the economy, um, state of uh, marijuana revenues, um, any looking at all of those uh, assumptions. Um, one of the things that we do when we're working on our, um, what we might call the out years, so the last three years in the forecast, we would um, 
look at eliminate really focusing on uh, recurring revenues. And then we eliminate at that point grants, current grants and one time revenues. So we're trying to eliminate the fluctuations that might have when we have large grants or other large projects. Our recurring revenues are property taxes, franchise fees, um, state shared revenues, interest on investments. So this slide does show the, some of the key assumptions that we uh, use when we're building the forecast for general fund revenues. Uh, the increase in property taxes has been very consistent over the last couple of years. It has been about 4%, and that's about where we are again for 1819. Um, as you know, that's a really important number because uh, property taxes are about 55% of our general fund revenue. And, uh, you know, we look at cable and garbage franchise fees. Um, uh, really, we look at um, the forecast is a very uh, extensive spreadsheet that really goes line by line. Uh, in our general ledger. So when you look at the budget and you see lines for uh, salaries and wages and a line for property tax revenue and a line for um, uh, insurance, the um, forecast actually goes to that level. So we are making some very broad assumptions in the forecast, uh, but we put actually a lot of time and effort into that. One of the things I did want to mention is that um, the revenues in this table do not include uh, any of the additional revenues that we might identify during the strategic planning process. So this table shows uh, a couple of things. The um, actual revenues for 17-18 is in the column on the left. The estimated is for 1819. Again, the numbers that we have for mid year. And then we're looking at forecast for 1920 and, um, and so forth. Um, I think what's important here to look at is the, the trends, um, the dollars amount or the specific percentage. Uh, it's a forecast. So due to the nature of forecast, we know there's going to be variance between these numbers and the actual, um, so I think it, what the, uh, is important to notice here is the, the trend. And what you can see is when we look at 2020 through 21 and the next couple of years, we're projecting that revenue will be fairly flat because we, we do not have any additional sources of revenue built into this forecast at this point. So when we're looking at revenues for the forecast, uh, for example, we're uh, projecting property tax revenue um, we're making assumptions about growth in assessed property values. So we may uh, usually we'll talk to the planning and building department to see what new construction looks like. Uh, we'll talk to the Yamhill County Assessor's Office. Uh, for franchise fee revenues, the, the main source is McMinnville Water and Light. And uh, they pay franchise fees based on their customers' consumption of electricity and Cascade Steel is their biggest industrial customer. So I will talk to the finance director at Water and Light and see if they have any uh, projected um, rate increases coming up in the next year or two. General fund, fund expenditures, we forecast very much in the same way as revenues where we're eliminating one-time expenses and grant-related projects. Uh, some of the key assumptions on this side are uh, the COLA, and right now what we have in the forecast is 2.25 to 2.5. I think that's reasonable, but again, we'll revisit that um, as we work on the budget. We have assumptions about increases in PERS rates, uh, health insurance, uh, materials and services. This is um, uh, supplies, um, program expenses in park and rec, any number of things. And we do a pretty broad uh, assumption about those line accounts. And, um, you know, from year to year it changes, but 2% is a pretty uh, decent trend for materials and services. The 5% increase in our insurance, um, it's usually where we start. But as we go through the year, uh, as we go through the budget process, we'll get a, 
uh, additional information from city county insurance and uh, we'll look at paid claims, for example, for uh, workers' comp and, um, and liability. That one's a little bit harder to predict, but usually city county will help us with um, making some estimates there. Uh, this last bullet point talks about the general fund transfer to the ambulance fund, which um, I think you're fairly familiar with. Um, when I talked to the city manager about this and this number, which looks like very, very big numbers, uh, we talked about how there's really a lot of moving parts right now with the ambulance fund. And in the next several years, we are expecting that we'll be making some major changes. So these numbers are really projections. Here again, we have a table with uh, projected expenditures. Um, one of the things that we're looking at here is um, the CPI, which, um, or the Consumer Price Index, which we use to base our COLA for employees. Um, you know, again, we're looking at uh, PERS. The PERS board generally will give us advisory rates and give us some recommendations on what they expect those rates to be doing going forward. Um, I also want to point out here that these expenditures do not include the impact of the fire or police union contract negotiations. Um, we have in this year's budget money for a salary survey for general service employees that any increases that general service employees may receive uh, because of that salary survey are not in these numbers. And we do not have any of the big dollars for deferred maintenance of the city building in this budget. And how, how did you uh, come, how, how was that? Um, why, why are none of those big numbers for the deferred maintenance um, included at this time? That is really something that as an executive team, we will be getting together to talk about in the next week or two and talking about how to incorporate the results of the facilities assessment study that we did, which is not final at this point, and incorporate that into what are our capital projects going to be, because typically in our capital outlay, we have, again, recurring expenditures. We know we have to maintain the police fleet. Uh, we know that we have vehicles and equipment and shelters at the park and other things that we just anticipate that's more operating. Uh, maintenance could be um, a fairly minor repair and maintenance projects. Um, so I might ask Jeff if he has anything to add to that. Sure, and the, the other piece of that is that part of the work that we'll be doing at the end of the month or early in next month as those facilities reports are finalized, we'll be putting together a plan to bring that information forward to the council, probably in a series of work session conversations so that you get a sense of what the issues are, uh, where the gaps are, what the need is near term, long term, um, be able to understand where it happens. So not all facilities are created equal. Some of them have more near term needs than others. Some of them have safety improvements that may need to be made. Uh, some of them, the amount of investment really calls into question the long-term viability of the facility. And so we're going to have a lot of information to churn through with the council and we'll be putting together a plan for that and bringing it forward to you during the course of this winter and spring. And it'll really set the stage for part of that budget conversation. But it's not a one-year fix. You know, our facilities, some of them are 75, 100 years old. Um, we're not going to fix it. It's not going to take 100 years to fix it, but it's not going to get fixed in one year either. Jeff, would another way to look at it, and going back to those uh, charts that Marsha gave us with the projected revenues and looking at those numbers and then looking at the projected expenditures, there's a gap For between sure. those. And so uh, my thought is there's going to be some hard decisions that are going to be ha have to be made if we're going to continue doing what we've been doing. And that's part of that strategic planning and some of the strategic budgeting that has to be done over time because you just can't take out of, uh, you know, out of the operations the way we've been going to do um, the maintenance and upgrading of our, build of our buildings. We may have to take a look at other ways of doing that. It may be a levy. Uh, so we'll have to determine 
how appropriate our, our expenses are today. And we've been looking very carefully, as you know, at that. And then you go back up to those revenues and say, we don't have much control over that. So it's a, it's a catch kind of, it's you're chase, chasing your tail a little bit in this whole process, as, as you know. So in my mind, that's what I'm thinking, along with what Jeff said, is that it's gonna, it's gonna find, uh, fine-tuning that pencil and really getting down to to our expenditures is a thought. I think a lot of the focus on the strategic plan also was looking at different sources of revenue and how we might <coughs> meet these needs. Oh, that's a very nice lead-in, Mr. Mayor, to this table, which shows revenues, expenses, and the difference, which is an operating deficit in this case. Again, uh, 17, 18 actual numbers are on the left. We're estimating 18, 19, and then the forecasted numbers. One of the things I wanted to point out here is that second row from the bottom, which is projected savings. So we always anticipate that when we're building the budget, we will have actual revenues probably more than we budget and expenditures less than what was budgeted. So. Uh, and a couple of places where that can happen. Um, you know, with property taxes, we may, uh, it might be 3.9% uh, or 4.1%, which can lead to a difference. With marijuana taxes, like we talked about, we're still really building a, a trend for that and a history. And in expenditures, the, usually the biggest reason why we underspend compared to the budget is, um, in the budget, we assume all positions are filled all year round. And uh, of course that typically doesn't happen. And so savings will come when uh, we have turnover and positions may remain open for a while. Uh, as you pointed out, um, this does show an operating deficit. Uh, and so we uh, include that savings number because we're wanting to, again, we have budgeted numbers and, but these forecasted numbers, we're including the savings because we're wanting to make our uh, projections here more uh, reasonable compared to the budget. This is closer to where we think we actually will be given there's assumptions and projections built into this. And uh, as you said, it does definitely show that expenses are growing at a faster rate than revenues. And as the operating deficit increases, of course, the reserve decreases. Uh, again, just to point out that, as you would expect, projections in the near or nearer term tend to be more accurate. The farther out you get, uh, the more variances there's going to be uh, because as we're in the strategic plan, especially a lot of things will change in the, by the time we get to 20, 20, 21 in those uh, out years. The city focuses on the general fund reserve. You hear us talk a lot about uh, the general fund reserve and uh, a percentage, what, what uh, percentage is the reserve at. So we use this reserve, or sometimes you'll hear us talk about fund balance as a indicator of uh, the financial health of the general fund. And it's, um, the, it helps determine that appropriate level of the general fund, and it is related to, of course, expenditures. So um, we think that's a, a good benchmark to use. We do have a city policy that recommends a 25% reserve in the general fund. However, the National Government Finance Officers Association, or the GFOA, um, recommends a minimum reserve of 17% of annual expenditures. And that 17% is a, a fairly simple calculation. It's actually based on having two months worth of operating expenses. And they recommend that as a, um, a minimum uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, we get the majority of our property taxes in November. So we have a period of time where in the general fund, we're receiving a really limited revenue. So by October, um, we our bank account is as low as it's going to be, and we want to make sure that we have an adequate reserve. It's really our working capital or provides cash flow for us. Um, 
until we start receiving property taxes in November. Uh, it really gives us some flexibility as well. Um, some of you uh, councillor members have remember back to uh, 09, 10, 11 in those times. Um, we had a uh, adequate reserve and when other cities were making really drastic cuts to personnel and programs and, and police officers, um, we did not need to do that because the reserve was our um, bridge, I think that is how Kent always referred to it. The reserve allowed us to bridge the gap between that downturn and when the economy started to improve. Um, and it was especially important because we didn't know how long the downturn was going to last. And uh, another reason for um, a adequate reserve is that it is one of the things that our credit rating agencies look at when we sell bonds. So the lower our credit rating, the more our interest expense on any debt that we issue. This table does show that uh, we're, we were at 30%, as I mentioned at the end of 17, 18. Estimated is uh, we're projecting that at the end of this current fiscal year, 18, 19, that will be 20% and then it's declining fairly st steadily thereafter. Here again, I want to point out that at the end of 18, 19, it may be 22% and it may be 18% in 1920. Um, there's a lot of uh, variables in these forecasts. And again, I think it's important to look at the trend, um, maybe more than just a uh, specific percentage. Again, uh, some of you have been here a little bit longer might remember that the general fund, we have actually had a 45, 48% uh, reserve in the past. And while that gives us a lot of uh, security, I guess, um, it, it really is making it, the, the reserve may have been higher than it needed to be really because when the reserve is that high, you basically have money in the bank that, or, uh, that you are not spending providing services to the citizens. So uh, we are looking at finding that reasonable balance between uh, stashing our money away in case something really bad might happen someday and uh, um, what's an adequate amount. So we, we're looking at somewhere between 17 and 20% for that. And just to console people here, because it looks pretty drastic for the next three or four years, it's looked like this, the projection every year <laughs> for the last five years. And we seem to pull it out every year. So I don't want you to get totally overwhelmed by this. It's just, you know, this is how it looks right now because there's a lot of things that can happen in between now and then. I know that Sal has a question or a comment, but let me expand on that a little bit. And one of the reasons that happens is that we've got sort of this structural imbalance, if you will, where our expenses tend to grow at a pretty steady uh, rate and our revenues grow at a steady rate. There's just a gap between those. And from year to year, our organization, like many's, makes midterm corrections and you sort of write your budget for the time you have. And what that tends to do is it, it, it sort of keeps that curve in place and keeps moving it out a year at a time. And until you either come up with a long-term revenue strategy where your revenue growth matches your expense growth, or if you decide to make reductions in expenses significantly so that you match the growth curve of your revenues, you're always gonna see that gap out there at some point in the future. Um, with, comparatively though, to previous years, we, we have increased services tremendously over the last few years, including um, things like we, there was a 20 year hiring freeze at the police department that um, was unfrozen maybe, what, three years ago, um, and other uh, expanse of services, um, a new substation at the fire department, um, and new equipment there. And, and uh, but some of those, especially the um, hiring increases, while in my opinion, necessary, absolutely necessary, um, those are more substantial uh, 
uh, long-term costs. Yeah. Uh, and so would you, um, not to be a Cassandra about the numbers, but you know, with, but there, but there is a difference. I would say going into this year than in previous years with a lot of those increased fixed costs. Mm -hmm. And so strategic plan focus on the ways to bring so balance another, to this. <laughs> yeah. So another way to reflect that is that over the last decade, um, we relied on those reserves to keep things relatively stable in the organization. Again, when, I mean, I, I worked in an organization for nine years, we reduced our staffing level by 20% in less than three fiscal years. Uh, there certainly were some reductions that were made um, here and there in this organization, but for the most part, uh, we didn't make really steep and drastic cuts. But what we also didn't do is we didn't invest to keep up with either growing demands of service or um, needs that were being deferred. And so over the course of that decade, we stayed pretty stable in terms of our non-public safety employment level. And last year, when we added a number of positions into the general fund, it was really the first reinvestment in staffing in non-public uh, safety operations in the city for about a decade. Uh, we'd, we'd made some reductions and we'd largely held the line. And so even with those reductions, uh, we've only seen about a 1% increase in staffing for non-public safety investments over the last 10 years. Uh, we have been making significant investments in public safety, particularly the last three or four years. Over that same decade, uh, we've increased staffing by about 20% in the police department and about 30% in the fire department. Marsha, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, with regards to PERS, how certain are we of the impact of that in these projections? Uh, PERS has, uh, of course, we know what our rates will be July 1 of 2019 and that they will be in uh, place for that biennium. The rates change every two years. Mm -hmm. So when they change again at July 1 of 2021, uh, PERS does provide advisory rates and they also um, let us know the status, ongoing status of the unfunded liability and what we can um, expect going forward. So I think this is where the forecast, um, where we really see a benefit from the forecast. Because again, once we get out to 2021, things are going to be much different, but we do have a pretty solid number for the PERS employer contribution rates. Good, great, thanks. So, Marsha, how, how do these numbers compare to the, um, the page Roman numeral four from the 2018-2019 budget that we adopted? I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, the, 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 the page Roman numeral four we had had general fund resources by type and gave a dollar amount of 28738695 and then general fund requirements, 28, 738, 695. So they balanced out, you know, in the budget that we adopted. And so I, what I'm trying to get a sense of is how these figures that you're giving us tonight relate to what we adopted. Well, I think without uh, having the numbers in front of me, I, I think I would go back to um, the way we, we budget, of course, like I said, we assume all positions are filled all year round. Um, we, and revenues for government agencies are really fairly predictable if you're not adding some new rev revenue stream or really um, uh, expanding on ones that you already have. So um, really, we track pretty closely to the budget. Um, you know, we're looking all the time, monitoring at uh, uh, how are the departments spending their operational money, how are um, salaries and fringe, how are we compared to the budget with those numbers. And so the variances really come in, um, again, when we have turnover and unfilled positions, sometimes we'll have projects that we budgeted for, like a repair and maintenance on a roof that we, didn't, we don't get done in that fiscal year. Um, 
So I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Yeah, I mean, what I was trying to get a sense of is if this, these numbers that you're giving us, I mean, I know some of the expenditures that we've had that were not anticipated in the budget that would have increased that, you know, what what's published online, but I'm just trying to figure out, it seems like there's just a big difference in the, in the, what I would have anticipated the revenues being with the expenditures given what we adopted last year. And I guess I'm just trying to get sorry, an apples I, I, to apples understanding of how these numbers relate to the numbers that were presented to us in the in the budget that we adopted. Yeah. So, Sal, you're looking at the budget document for 2000. What we adopted versus right. what they're presenting. And I apologize, I'm not ignoring you. I think Jeff is working Jeff's on the budget document. Find it. Well, and I can do that. I don't mean to delay the meeting. No, I can get right. that information no, offline. Okay. I think fine. I can get to it here pretty quick. Again, in the budget document, and I'm just talking off the top of my head, we have two categories. We've got the general funds, and then we have all the funds coming in that uh, are, are almost reserved to go to certain places that we have no control. And I think th what we're looking at in tonight's presentation is the general fund. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Quick question in, relate, in relation to that. Um, normally, you you go through a, a year-end process, correct, where you do the analysis to find and to determine what you've spent in the prior year. So year-end closeouts is something that you're working on currently or perhaps already have it established, correct? Uh, our fiscal year ends June 30. June 30, okay. Yes. So you did that back in June for the prior year budget? Correct. So you would have those numbers um, available online to the public? Uh, comparison of actual to budget. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that that is online. Okay. So does that does that um, actually come into into play when you're determining the next year's budget? Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, I think. I think um, what you're pointing to is, um, you know, I said we do really uh, budget down to the line item. So um, we're going to look, and the departments are uh, do a great job of looking at their budgets and really um, monitoring them very closely. We uh, have uh, rarely have to do budget amendments other than in situations where something happens that we didn't expect to happen. Um, but yes, we're looking at, uh, you know, insurance would be a good example. Uh, any other number of uh, workers' comp uh, claims, that kind of thing, to carry forward, I guess, what we learned from the prior fiscal year into the next year's budget. And so tonight, there's a good example of uh, making an amendment to the budget for, if I'm not mistaken, for the airport fund and the dollars that we need to um, put towards the uh, the repair of the uh, gas tank tanks out there. Sal, I think. Yeah, it helps to sit next to a CPA at these meetings. Um, so Kelly, Kelly corrected the, um, the uh, question that I had, and uh, I can address that with staff outside oh, okay. of the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so Leanna, were your questions answered? It wasn't actually a question. It was, um, I understand the business process, and I was just helping you to respond at that Thank point. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, the other piece is Marsha will come to the council and update us as to where we sit to budget on a uh, maybe twice a year, possibly. Mm -hmm. And and then that report is a part of our packets. So that is available to anyone that would be following our agenda uh, but I, I don't know that you post that on the uh, finance page of what that is, because it's just a report to council, that, but it is available. Yes. Um, here again, I just want to mention again, looking at these numbers and, and they um, decline, as I said, steadily. Um, but where we, um, and we are faced with challenges like other governmental agencies in the um, 
state of Oregon. So, you know, looking to the future, we do have a uh, challenge in finding a way to mitigate that gap between revenues and expenditures and maintaining the adequate reserve. Um, a strategic long range financial plan is going to really be an essential part of, of that process. So we've talked about a long range financial plan for the city in the past. And one of the things that we can do is look, at, look to the um, National Government Finance Officers Association, the GFOA, which has uh, quite a number of uh, well vetted, uh, um, very reasonable best practices. And as I was looking at uh, long range financial planning and uh, the GFOA's best, best practices, uh, they um, describe long term financial planning as combining fiscal forecasting with strategizing. And it works best as a part of an overall strategic plan. Uh, a couple of high level steps there determine the scope. They recommend five to 10 years. Of course, do an analysis, talk to your internal and external stakeholders, identify your service policies and procedures, and then adopt and execute the plan. Uh, so of those um, two aspects of the long range plan that they've identified, financial forecasting, this is what we do. Uh, it's a process of projecting revenues and expenditures over a long term period using assumptions and economic conditions, scenarios, uh, and other salient variables. So we're, we do that, I think, and we do it fairly well. Uh, the other piece of that was the strategizing, which we certainly have undertaken with our strategic plan. And uh, the um, long term financial plan is I like this description, it's a process of aligning financial capacity with long term service objectives. So as with any plan, uh, after it's adopted, strategies have to be put in place and uh, to put that plan into action. And one of those steps could certainly be identifying funding that would be required to achieve our goals. And um, I guess the last thing that uh, the, I would say from the GFOA is that execution of that plan is where strategies become operational through the budget, financial performance measures, <laughs> Similar to our mid-year updates and our uh, 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 check-ins that we do with the council periodically through the year. And lastly, of course, action. Um, I think actually that brings us back around to the strategic plan that we talked about earlier. I really liked how the GFOA described this process. Um, is there any other questions? So why don't we, uh, why don't we start with uh, budget committee members. And so John, any questions? Uh, any concerns that you have as we try to position ourselves to be able to understand our role as a budget committee? Um, I do have a little bit of a concern that um, the, the goal for the reserve seems to be eroding. And I hear the goal that uh, this body put forward of 25% reserve. And then I hear another goal put forward for mm -hmm. the, the GFOA, which is 17 to 20%. And I uh, would would hope that the goal set by this body would be the um, one that staff shoots for. Thank you, John. Uh, Jerry, any any comments from your perspective? Uh, well, I you know like the decline in the reserve is striking, um, and I don't know that I actually understand why why that is. So, you know, hopefully, I'll, I'll find that out. Okay. Um, I'll go down, Drew. So uh, just from my background, I, I don't necessarily, I, I would echo maybe the long-term concerns of the, bud of the uh, budget reserves eroding, um, but given it's already high level, I wouldn't necessarily, it's not exactly disastrous right now or anything like that, but um, uh, from my own background, we're at our current point in the business cycle, it is a little bit risky. If say in the next five years, we were to experience a recession of some sort and we were still drawing down on the, on the budget reserves, I'd be concerned, but I mean, we're currently sitting at what, somewhere between 20 and 30% right now. I think we still have ample, ample time if that becomes an issue, so. Thank you, Drew. Uh, Leanna, any other questions? Um, you know, my, my uh, 
my viewpoints on a reserve is that it's going to be used when you have their deficits in other areas of the budget. But my biggest concern would be your operating income having uh, having a deficit like that. You're not able to add more operations to the budget at all at this point because you have negatives that you're dealing with. So I think some of the concern as a budget committee, we would want to focus in on what we can do to raise our raise our revenues to meet those demands. Thank you, Leanna. A cherry? Well, it all depends on the priorities you guys set in your meeting on Friday and the process that you go through in setting those priorities. So and then that, that really kind of gives us our marching orders. Can I say one more thing? Sure. I just want to say thank you for all you've done um, with the strategic planning and efforts you've made as a committee yourselves. It's definitely a reflecting. Thank you. I'll open it up to uh, members of the council. Any any further concerns or uh, direction that you want to give staff as we're getting prepared for the budget? I'll start down. Uh, Zach, nope. Remy, Wendy. Adam, uh, Sal, and uh, Kelly. And the last thing that I just want to share, and I've shared this many times, and those that we've interviewed for the budget committee, I've shared this, but how fortunate we are with our finance department. Uh, bar none, and I've seen a lot of budgets uh, and that's one thing that I look at and I go on websites to other communities within Oregon and how readable and user-friendly and the narrative that goes along with our budgets. It could be all numbers, but really what we're trying to do is blend a storage, a story by department of where, what, what accomplishments have we had and where we're going. Um, and unmet needs so that we have an opportunity to look and come away and say, boy, I get a full, I get a full picture in this department. And then the hard decisions are made. <laughs> and that's done with, uh, you know, with department heads who really know their business. And then Jeff uh, having an opportunity along with Marsha being able to really fine tune that, bringing it to to the budget committee. And I'll tell you, budget committee, you get the first look at the budget as, as the council does, okay? And so <clears throat> it's taking ownership and preparing and asking questions and going in to see what's happening. We all have that opportunity. I've never had a, I've never had a situation where I've gone into Marsha or Jeff and says, help me understand this. And I said, no, it's none of your business. Just walk away. You know, I've never had that. And I walk away better prepared. So I'll put a little onus back on us, <laughs> all of us. Um, you know, some, some of us have had many, many years in this process, and some have had not even one year yet. So we're going anywhere from 25 years of experience on this table to um, a couple of months. Okay, and we're all there, but we're all together looking from different perspectives, and that's why we have the makeup of the budget committee the way it is. We all have different perspectives. We have uh, different experiences, but I would say that we all have a passion for numbers and understanding the story that the numbers give. So, Marsha, taking back to your staff, you know, we, we, we don't tell them enough how much we appreciate what they do, and especially under your direction, because from my perspective, you're the orchestrator of what we have in our hands today under your direction. And, and you know, we've been able to provide a system, and a, a computer system that allows us the software to do some phenomenal things compared to where we used to be, and you're utilizing that to the nth degree. So I say thank you and take that back to staff. And Jeff, you know, your insightfulness of, of where we need to go, you bring tremendous value. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll work as a total body to be where we need to. And I will, I will echo, 
<clears throat> you know, that uh, the reserve is something that we have to keep our eye on. And, I'm, uh, and I feel really good under looking to the future where uh, Marcia says increasing revenues with a goal of keeping the reserve between 17 and 20. It's there. We're focused on that. We just need to make sure that um, this process doesn't get away from us and that we're making the right decisions. So with that being said, Thank you so much for the presentation tonight. And budget man members, thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedules to be with us earlier in the year. We'll go ahead and conclude our joint uh, meeting with the, the budget committee this evening. Good job, Marcia.